numbers. I'm going to get into map projections, more good, good old nerdy stuff that isn't really exciting to learn about. At least I don't think so, um, but incredibly important. Again, eating our vegetables, right? That's what we're, we're doing. This is what we're going to get through here. So let's just get moving. Okay, so think back to the geodesy stuff, right? Talking about latitude and longitude, and we got into the shape of the earth. Uh, and, and what's the shape of the earth? Is it a sphere? Of course not. We all know that. You should be shouting, it's a geoid, you, you dummy, uh, into your phone or computer or whatever at this point. So yeah, that's, that's what we've, we've covered so far. Now here's the deal. What we're working with in this class is we're bringing we're bringing the entire Earth, right? Reality, right? The actual Earth. We're trying to bring it down to a manageable representation that we can use. All right. The easiest way to do this is to take the Earth and just shrink it down, and that's what a globe is. It's just it's it's just smaller. It's just a smaller Earth, and everything. Is, oh, it's fantastic uh, on a globe. Everything's just the right, you know, shape and size and relation and, and all that. Like, it just works It's because it's just smaller. It's just a smaller little version. So it's great. A great way to do this. But we have some problems when we do that. And it really, it's it's just, frankly, it's using a globe. It's It's not that fantastic. Like, it's good if we need to explain... You know, like like solar system stuff. Like when I'm talking about the Earth seasons in other classes, and you guys have heard me talk about that. It's great. I pull out my globe, I spin it around. I'm I'm using it as a prop. But if I need to do anything remotely uh, important uh, in terms of mapping stuff, figuring out where something is or whatever, globe isn't going to be the best way to go about this. I mean, one issue. Like, let's just look. Here's the, uh, it's not a globe. Here's just a picture of the uh, Earth that we're looking at right here. It's cool. It's pretty. But, but one issue, when you look at this thing, you can only see, it's, in fact, it's not even half. It's less than half. You can only see about, I think it's like 47% of the Earth at any one time, right? So it's not half because of the curvature and stuff kind of, you can see it kind of fades as you're getting over to the edges right there. So, I mean, it's great. Like, if I wanted to look at Brazil right now, cool. I can see it. Um, maybe I don't want to look at Brazil right now. Or maybe what I want to do is I want to look at Brazil, but I also want to look at China. Can't do it. Can't do that in reality. But you know what I can do? Check this out. I can look at a map. I can look at a map of the world. My God. There's Brazil right there. There's China right over there at the exact same time. That's amazing. Think about that. You're not thinking about it. You don't think this is as amazing as it actually is, but it is. Because because what's going on here is we're defying reality in looking at the map, in looking at every bit of the map at the exact same time here, right? And at what we call uh, an orthographic angle. We're looking at it orthographically, meaning that our eyes are hitting the surface of the earth at a nice 90 degree perpendicular angle here, and it's doing that for every inch of the earth with this specific world map. You cannot do that. If we, see, if we go back here, say you're up in the, the space shuttle, or whatever, took this uh, uh, photo right here, and you're looking back at the earth, you can't do that. You can't look orthographically at the Earth, at every inch of the Earth. Yeah, you got Brazil right there, but as soon as you start to look elsewhere, your, your gaze is hitting the surface of the Earth at a different angle. This is phenomenal. That's a big thing with a map, is that we're able to do this. But what we're going to get into with this particular lecture is, well, that's, this is very cool. There's some issues with it and that maps frankly most maps that exist well, they've got they've got problems all right and we know this we're aware of this. well i should say those of us who work with maps are aware of this 
But we're not really taught this early on in school, and we just kind of tend to trust maps, so we don't think about what's actually going on and how did we get this representation of a round-ish planet and lay it flat, right? That's a key, key thing here. So thing number one to take here, a map is a, uh, it's a scaled representation of reality. And so I throw that scaled in there because we always want to be thinking about scale, whether you did well on our last scale exercise or, or not. We'll continue to work on it because we always want to think in terms of what is the scale at which this map is drawn or, or at which scale is this map actually useful. All right, but it's also, it's a representation of reality. We're taking the real world and we're making it, we're making it work for us, but we're picking and choosing, we're making certain decisions, and so we need to be aware of that. I had another thing as you start to mess around with making maps is we want to think about what are they actually made up of, and so we have points, lines, polygons, and type, right, the words on the map. And an example here, this is a real basic example, so this is looking at GIS software. Some of you guys have experience with it, some of you don't. But this is just a map. I just I threw in some different layers in here to make a quick map. So we have the actual shape of California, right? That would be a polygon, meaning a shape with multiple sides here. So all of this pinkish color that we see in here, that's the polygon. The roads would be lines, these little points right here for the specific towns and cities. Well, there you go, there are the uh, points, right? And then the type is stuff like California and, you know, Delano, Ridgecrest, that, that kind of stuff, right? So all of these things, we're taking the reality, right? We know, I've been to, you know, I've, hell, I've been to all these places right here, just kind of looking around, doing the, the cataloging. Um, but yeah, so I know these places exist, right? They are, they're out there. In, in the real world, but this is very clearly a representation uh, of what they are. Clearly, when we're driving out on the roads, well, the roads aren't like a, a hot pink color or purple or whatever that is, and we don't, like when we're driving from Palmdale to Lancaster, you don't start at like this one point that just says Palmdale, and then you drive a little bit, and then you hit a point that says Lancaster and all that. No, reality is different. We're representing it. Right, in a key way. And that might be obvious when we look at this stuff here, but what I'm going to be showing you is there's a lot of stuff that isn't quite so obvious when we start to mess around with maps or like really start to use them for meaningful analysis and to get real answers from these things. All right, so here's issue number one, something I want you to keep in mind, take notes on this stuff, have it handy. Just this is good stuff to know, just to be aware of. And to start with, we got our, our Earth, and our Earth is this funky thing. It's not that perfect sphere like the Greeks thought. But the result of this and our different conceptions of the shape of the Earth, right? Going from the Greeks' perfection to uh, Newton's squishy ball, right? The oblate spheroid. Uh, to the geoid, the, the model that we really rely on now, this concept we have now, uh, we've made maps, you know, throughout this whole period of time. We haven't waited until we figured out the shape to then go ahead and make maps. We, we had to work with what we had. So we've modeled the Earth in a variety of ways, as we'll see. I'll point out some key ones. But we've modeled the Earth to really be the basis for a lot of our maps. And it's important to understand what these names and dates and stuff are if you're working with maps, and especially when you start using GPS with maps and, and recording data with this thing and then bringing it over to this other thing and, and so on, okay? Um, so to start with, and so you can see here, like with this image that I stole from some government agency, um, I don't remember which one. I'm much too busy to put credit uh, on here. But so it's showing this idea of the perfect sphere 
and then it says spheroid, and then parentheses ellipsoid. An ellipsoid is used. I like to use oblate spheroid because it's just that it, that's more the squishy ball thing. Um, but an ellipsoid it means the same idea. But it's that that concept that yeah, it's more football shaped, and this clearly is an exaggeration. The Earth doesn't look like this from space. But what we've done to, to use this Newtonian concept of the squishy ball, we've used things like here in North America, this Clark 1866 model. Okay, uh, And this is pretty much all maps that were made for North America um, before the year 1980 rely on this Clark 1866 model. I'm not going to test you on what the semi-major axis is or the semi-minor axis or any of that. So, and the semi, thing, it, it means the radius. It just kind of means, you know, it's half of the diameter there is, is what we're dealing with. Um, you know, I don't have this stuff memorized or whatever. But what you can see when you look at the numbers, it, it, they're, they're much closer than this, this football image would suggest. But the deal with this... Uh, is that it's one version, one model that we have, one way to represent, um, you know, our, our planet. But then we also have others. And so as we started to figure out this concept of the geoid, we started to incorporate that into new models. So for stuff in North America, after 1980, we use this GRS geodetic reference system of 1980 and so this was a a better model a more accurate correct model of what the planet is doing and so you can see in the red we've got that clark 1866 model going on there and honestly this is for north america so of course it's it's funky and it's going to leave stuff out you wouldn't want to use clark 1866 for a map of you know whatever Japan, England, something like that, because that's not what it's designed for. So it's it's specific to a place. But you can see with the GRS uh, 80 line, the what is it, the blue or whatever color it is in here, dark blue or something my eyes are shot. Um, yeah, it's a it it looks kind of more like an all encompassing planet. Uh, and so this is the result of satellite measurements and and just just getting a better idea of what the planet actually looks like and having our maps reflect that. Okay, and then we also have, I think I'm on the next one. Uh, yeah, I mentioned WGS84. Let me just show you back here. So that WGS World Geodetic System of 1984, very similar to that GRS one, but that's a global system, hence the world name in there, right? Now with all of these, we can work in any of this stuff. And there's nothing wrong with, for a lot of what we do, nothing wrong with using that Clark 1866 model, especially if the, the maps we're using or the data that we're dealing with in general, if it's a pre-1980 situation that we've got going on. And you may you may have that. I mean, that Lancaster map that, that we're using, that's from 1974, right? So that clearly in that original form that was done with this Clark 1866 model. And we have another key thing here, which is what we call the horizontal datum. And so it's an origin point for coordinate systems, things like latitude and longitude and UTM and that kind of stuff. Um, but it's tied, this datum is tied to the specific model of the Earth. All right, so with Clark 1866, Typically, what we see is NAD 1927, which stands for the North American Datum of 1927. Okay, tied into this little spot in Kansas right here um, in terms of the, the origin point. <coughs> Later, we have the North American Datum of 1983, all right, which is connected with that GRS 1980 model. And clearly, there's a little you know, overlap stuff going on in there, but you get the idea. So it's a, a newer concept. This is, and this is what I think 
it, it's still like federal policy. All of our federal stuff, current stuff, is done with this NAD 83 GRS 1980 system. Yeah, and it's it's a thing where it's an actual 3D system. So it's like I said, it's getting more complex. And now we actually model the planet. And then this WGS, the World Geodetic System of 1984, this is actually both a model and a coordinate system. So it's your datum as well as your model of what the Earth looks like. And it's a truly global system. And that's what your cell phone is based in. And a lot of GPS stuff defaults to this WGS 1984. Which is good to know, because here's the deal. With all of this, I don't know if I've mentioned this to you guys yet or, or not, but with all this stuff, if you are using your GPS and it's set to WGS 1984, and you take down some you know, waypoints, you get the coordinates, some UTM coordinates, let's say, and it says you know, this exact stuff. You're easting and you're northing and, and all that, and this is stuff we're going to get into. If you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. In fact, let's just not even say that. Let's talk lat long in sticks. We've discussed that, right? So I use my GPS set to WGS 1984, and I get my latitude. I get my longitude. It's there on the screen, and I go, great. And then I take a paper map that I'm recording some of this stuff on, let's say, just to keep it simple right here. Uh, and so I plot it like you guys have done, right? So I figure out where, okay, there's the latitude. There's the longitude, these things intersect, boom. There's my point right there. Here's the problem. That only works if my map is also using WGS 1984. If my map has, you know, NAD 27, Clark 1866 as its basis, as that's what's, what's uh, kind of the, the uh, underlying system on which this map is written, I could still plot that point, Right? I'll have the place. I can figure out where it should be. But the problem is it could be placed in the wrong location. And it all gets into these origin points and how this stuff works. So you can be hundreds of feet off from where you think you actually are. I mean, you're still close. It's not like it's going to say you're on the other side of the planet. But it can be pretty significant. Right? If you're trying to record. Say you found something doing some kind of field research, and you, uh, uh, you know, you, you want to record it so that we, we have a record, we can go back to it and all of that. If you're going, uh, you know, across these different datums and, and models and, and all that, and, and not taking that into account, I should say, you can still work across these ways, but you just have to know what you're doing, right? But if you don't know what you're doing, well, then you can be, you can be horribly wrong, you can put it in the exact wrong location and you never find this thing ever again, right? And it actually throws all of your research into question because there's one error that we know of, right? But how many more else exist, okay? Same deal. If you're, you're out somewhere, you know, relying on GPS and maps and your compass and all that to try to find some location, you got to get to something and you're following along with your GPS and you're plotting it on the map, yeah, you could be going further and further away from that spot where you need to get to so you're not paying attention to this stuff. Now, when we work with GPS, don't worry. I will go over that. I'll show you guys how to change the stuff, how to, how to check that kind of stuff. And it's also a case, let's say you take the GPS, uh, you know, information, you get the data, right, out in the field. And you know you're using this WGS 1984, and then you go, oh, shoot. Yeah, I did all that, but I got to work. My map is in this NAT 83. You know, do I, do I have to go out and do it all over again? No, there are ways to work with it. We'll discuss that as well when we get into this, this data acquisition stuff. So don't worry about that. But it's just something I want you to be aware of, okay? Hence, hence my, my harping on this this simple little concept right here all right okay good pep talk uh pep talk over uh okay now here's the other deal to think about so we got a round ish geoid planet that we're on but how do we take this roundish thing and just lay it flat 
mean, that sounds simple enough, but it's actually quite the challenge. The classic thing that, that's always, you know, this is what I was taught and what I continue to teach my students, it's just that analogy of peeling an orange. Because an orange is actually, it's perfectly, it's a geoid. And the fact that it's kind of lumpy and not perfect, but looks pretty close from far away, you know, that, that idea. So think of the, the peel of the orange as the Earth's surface. And we need to, we need to make it flat into like a world map. So you can start peeling it. And sure, you can, you know, have one continuous peel as you're going along here. Uh, but then when you lay it flat, uh, it, it don't look like no map, right? I mean, you, you look at these things right here. I mean, this this octopus-looking thing is the best example. Some of these are just, we I don't know what's going on here. But to like to make it flat here, look at that. That's that's awful. That's not the Earth. I've never seen a map that looks like that. That doesn't look right. But that's all you can do, all right? The point is that you can't take something round and make it perfectly flat. It's just physically impossible. In fact, homework assignment, if you don't believe me, go to the grocery store, take an orange, just take it. If anybody gives you trouble, just say it's for geography. They'll let you go, I'm, I'm sure. You know, just pay for it, just to be safe. Uh, you know, yeah, who knows these days with COVID uh, and all that. But so, okay, pay for the orange uh, and bring it home. And what you can even do, this, this is extra fun, um, you know, you draw a little continents on there, maybe draw some latitude and longitude, and then peel that sucker, see what you can do. You're not gonna make it look beautiful at all. You're gonna have to stretch and tear and just distort the hell out of this thing so that it's not actually useful. Here's an example. If we took a globe and we peeled it, this is best case scenario, right? And, and same for your orange too. You could get something that looks like this but that don't look right. That's not, no, that's not, oh, look at our country, our beautiful United States, just torn apart like that makes me sick, right? That's, that's not right. Uh, what we're used to is something like this. And so it's the difference here is rather than trying to peel this thing, right? What we're trying to do is project the globe. And so that's what a map projection is it's a way of taking this round earth roundish earth and making it look good on a flat piece of paper all right but there's some there's some magic involved in here and it's all you know it's mathematically based and, and scientific and in, in application but it's still it's it's magic it's an illusion it's what we're doing it's not like you know actual magic like little fairies or whatever do it but you get what i'm saying like it, it's an illusion how this works that's a, a key thing to think about so a map projection I have here it's a systematic reproduction of a globe and the graticule which is our concept of latitude and longitude or some other you know coordinate system right but it's a systematic reproduction of this stuff onto a flat sheet of paper the key thing here is systematic Right? meaning that there, there are methods that we follow when we do this. It's scientific. We're not just uh, drawing it like we, we think it should look. So it's in, in the sense of it being scientific in this way, it is correct, but again, it's an illusion. There's some stuff going on, and that's what I want you guys to really be aware of here as we start to you know, mess around with this stuff, when we start to use this stuff. Okay? So with this systematic reproduction, what you need to know is there's always going to be distortion. And distortion is the, the, the catch-all term for all of the stretching and tearing and filling in the gaps and all that stuff that we have to do to go from that roundish planet to make it flat. All right? This is showing, going back to that idea of a peeled globe, Right, rather than just leaving it as that nice little, you know, sliver thing that gets pointy up at the poles and, and fatter at the equator, rather than leaving it like that with that projected map, stuff gets stretched out, things get filled in, right? And our eyes don't really know what's going on because this is a representation and we never actually see the earth 
in this way, right? In, in or in the the way of that it is in reality, right? We're used to if we're looking at the entire Earth, we're actually used to seeing it wrong through this illusion, and that's why it, it gives us some some trouble when we we start to do it uh, because we 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 just think it looks right because right? that's what we grew up with. I'll get, and I got examples here. Don't don't worry. This is getting too abstract. I nearly I nearly made a Plato reference, but I stopped myself. That's how that's how committed I am to not getting overly nerdy um, with this stuff here. All right. So we've got our <coughs> our round Earth up here in the upper left here of this image, right? So roundish. We're cool. We're going down to this map projection right here but then what this is showing this is kind of i look at it i don't know why i grabbed this oh i get i, I know why i did it okay so what is it showing it's a terrible diagram but the idea with this is that yeah okay we've got this map projection but here's the deal we got different types of map projections right we got a bunch of them not a single one is perfect and so if you look at this we're looking at the continent of Africa, right here. Hopefully you recognized it, Americans. Um, but so we're looking at this right here. We've got we've got three different Africas. They're similar. Like we look at them and we go, "That's Africa," right? Because we can we can tell. But if you really look at them, there's some differences in the shape and the just the the way Africa looks here. And a clue with the differences. Sometimes it's harder to really tell the difference from the uh, you know the continents themselves. But look at the graticule. Look at those latitude and longitude lines. Right? We see with the conformal example here, nice little squares. Everything's meeting at these right angles. Fantastic. This equidistant one in the middle. Right? Some of those. Um, Latitude and longitude lines are meeting at these nice 90 degree angles, but then other ones aren't. It starts to kind of curve and get wonky as you go out. And the equivalence one, same kind of deal. It's 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 weird looking. And actually, I think it looks cooler, right? It just it just I don't know. It looks nicer aesthetically. Um, but yeah, but there's there's something going on there. There's this difference at work. Okay, so that's another key thing. Not only when we have a map projection are we introducing some kind of distortion and screwing some stuff up, but there are a bunch of different types of map projections that all screw up reality in slightly different ways. All right. This image just came from Arthur Robinson, who was seen as the father of, of modern cartography. Cool guy, helped us defeat Nazis with his, his cartography. I mean, for real. Uh, uh, Super cool, um, right there. But he, he introduced a lot of the conventions that we we still use today. In fact, I think I've already talked to you about about his stuff, like the uh, you know map communication models and, and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, important guy. And this is from his book. What is it? Elements of cartography. It's a it's a classic cartography textbook. Is what I learned on. You know the. I don't know, seventh edition or whatever it wound up being. But this is one thing he did to illustrate this idea of map projections and how they can be different. And it's always fascinated me. Some of you guys have probably heard me go on and, and on about this in, in other classes. Um, but, but with this, what he did was he drew this blue bald man in the top, top projection. I think it's a mold out of projection. Um, up there, so he drew it there, and then he reprojects it in this Mercator projection in the middle. And you can see the bald blue man; his head kind of swells up, right, and his chin juts out. And then he does it again on the bottom, and now the guy's head kind of squishes down in this way. And so, what he's trying to show is how these different projections can tweak stuff. Um, now, those of you who heard me talk about this, you've seen me. What I, what I do is I, I like this idea, but it doesn't work. And I pull up Brad Pitt's face and I put it in the globe and we, you watch his head get distorted um, in there. What I would do, if it weren't for this damned pandemic, is we'd be in the, the lab and we'd have all the computers and you guys would be playing around with that stuff. 
sorry, we don't get to distort Brad Pitt's beautiful face. Um, next time, right? Uh, some some other day in the in the future, geographers. But still, it gives us this idea of you know of distortion. And somebody uh, took it even further, right? Um, and did two heads, one on you know either hemisphere here, like you're seeing in the upper right, to go even further and to show even more how this, you know, blue bald man guy, uh, like what's going on with his head. And so when you look at this, you can see what this is showing, um, like this right here, this Lambert conformal conic, it's doing okay right here, right, with this guy, but not so much with this guy. And so like maps of North America, you'll see using this Lambert conformal conic uh, projection because, hey, we just care about North America. We don't really care about what's happening on the other side of the planet. And that's great because all this distortion is taking place over here, right? The polyconic, we'll, um, we'll see that with these topographic maps later on. Um, so there, you know, you can see there's a lot of distortion, but some of these are better than others in specific locations. And therefore, that's the one that works right, for whatever it is you need. To do so, what we're going to learn, and and you know, hopefully, you'll you'll hold on to this. But there's a lot, so don't panic if it's if it's a lot to start with. But what we're going to learn are just some of these basic types of projections and what they do well and what they don't do so well and all that. So you have a, a working knowledge of what's going on when we take the round Earth, make it flat. Right? That's the the idea. So we got these four key things that we need to to be aware of this and this it says decisions this is what cartographers are doing when they're go when they're starting from scratch basically when they're saying okay I'm going to take this roundish planet going to make it flat they need to think about okay what surface am I going to use what's the orientation going to be where's my light source going to be at and therefore what retained properties is my my map actually keep? All right, that's that's what we're doing. You know, when we start, you guys, we're not going to make any new map projections. But what's good to it's good to have a general idea of what these decisions are, so you know you have a better idea of what you should pick. Right, when you need you need a map that's going to do this or that's going to do that or or whatever. Okay, that's the that's the idea here. All right, so these projection surfaces. I'm gonna go kind of quickly with this because we ain't we ain't making uh, these things, but still we we gotta know them. So we've got this planar, or sometimes called azimuthal, uh, conical and cylindrical. And the the planar one, the first one, it's it's flat. So a flat sheet of paper, right? That's that's what we're talking about. Conical. It's a cone. Cylindrical. It's a cylinder. And so the idea. This all comes from the original way in which we did this stuff, where you effectively, you you had a globe and you'd put a light inside it, like burn a candle or whatever, and actually project out the, the information on the globe onto the sheet of paper, right? A very archaic way of doing this, you know, going back centuries. It's, that's when this stuff started here. Um, so that's, it's the projection idea is we're projecting something from the globe onto a sheet of paper. So we need to know what kind of paper we're going to use, right? That's the idea here. So, so this first one, like I said, flat sheet. And what we do is we simply, we place it over the globe somewhere. It's going to touch. There's going to be one point at which it actually touches. And you can see with this uh, um, diagram here, it's a standard line and the parentheses point. I'll explain that um, in a bit when we get into the orientation part, but that's that's where it's actually touching. So if you you know if you have a globe at home and you want to play along, you just hold a flat sheet of paper up against the globe, and you'll see that it touches at one point, and then you project the stuff off, and and there you go. Very simple concept. And so like this this mnemonic one um, right there, very useful for if you're you're doing a, a map of the North Pole or the South Pole, because that's a, a single point. So when we see like a 
map of Antarctica, it's demonic projection. That's that's one that would be good to use if you're dealing with Antarctica. But you can see, like in this case, we're looking at the North Pole. Um, as you move further from the North Pole, stuff gets funky. It gets stretched out. It's that distortion, right? So again, we want to know what are we? What is this map for? What do we actually need to see, and what don't we care about? Right, so that's the planar uh, conical. It's a cone, so we we put this little cone on one end of the uh, globe. We project the stuff out, and then it's called developing, where you you would cut that and unroll it, and voila, there's your map. Right, and so you can see this one right here of North America. This conical guy. We saw that Lambert conformal conic one earlier. I think that was the one we looked at. Um, so it's got that, you know, conic in there. This is the Albers equal area conic projection. So again, it's, it's letting you know in the name, yeah, we used a cone shaped sheet of paper. A lot of the stuff today, it's, you know, it's computers and stuff where we do it, but it's still that general idea as we're modeling this stuff. Okay. So that's the cone. And then finally, the cylindrical idea, it's a tube. It's a cylinder. We slide over the uh, earth, project the stuff out, unroll it, right? Develop it, cut it, and un unroll it, and we've got our map right there. And the cylindrical can be great for, um, you know, for looking at the entire planet, right? More or less. Or, or looking at the, the parts of the planet where people live, maybe is a way to think about it. I'll get into what that means in a bit, but there you go. You can see that. So that's what we mean by the surface. Okay, next we have orientation. This is referring to the point or line of tangency or what we call the standard line or the standard point, which I mentioned just moments ago. Okay, so the orientation is going to be where this line of tangency, basically meaning this line where the surface touches the actual globe, right? Orientation is going to depend on where this actually takes place. And this is important because at this standard line or line of tangency, there's no distortion. That map is beautiful. Everything is represented beautifully, okay? But once you go away from that standard line or line of tangency, the distortion gets worse and worse. So you want to know, if you're making a map, okay, I need to make a map of this, this place over here. You want to have your standard line or standard point, line of tangency, you know, point of tangency, whatever. You want to have that as close to the place you're mapping as possible. And then also, if you need to use a map, and you're like, oh, I really need a map of this place, you're going to want to pick something that's been made with a uh, projection that has its standard line right next to the place where you're actually studying or going to or, or whatever, right? So that you have as little distortion as possible. And so with this, like we saw that mnemonic projection, we saw, um, you know, where it's just, it's that point, it was touching at the actual North Pole. So what we're saying with, with that is that that map, that North Pole, wow, beautiful. No distortion whatsoever. But the further away we went, like we saw, stuff gets stretched out. The size and the shape and all this stuff it just gets weird, right? So now with orientation, we describe it as being normal, which is if, it's, if it looks like this right here. So we've got the cylinder example. Um, so we've got that normal orientation where it's, it's that red line is that line of tangency. And in this case, it's touching the equator. Then we can also have transverse, so where it's 90 degrees from normal, and that's the same transverse as in uh, UTM, Universal Transverse Mercator, be explaining how that works at some point. And then oblique is where it's, it's, I don't know, it's somewhere in between, normal and transverse. And it doesn't matter, like you can do any of this stuff, but it's a question of, hey, what do I, what do I need here? Do you know, in this case, if I'm making a map of the world, do I need that that accuracy along the equator or pretty close to it? Or 
I actually need to really follow a line of longitude, like transverse, right there. Or maybe, I don't know, I'm doing some kind of wacky, you know, thing of Asia or, or something. And if I do an oblique uh, orientation there with the cylindrical surface, maybe I can get the right map. It'll just, it'll work all the better for what it is I want to do. Right? That's the, that's the idea. We always want to be aware of where our standard line is. And in some cases too, I'll say you, you know, with these like topographic maps that we're dealing with, a lot of these decisions have been made for us. We don't need to worry about this uh, because it's already, it's been done, right? The USGS did the research, did the work and said, okay, this projection we're using it's, it's going to work perfectly for, for anybody who needs this map of Lancaster to, you know, do whatever they're going to do in their Geography 201 class. Yeah, the, what we're doing here, it'll be great for them. So for some of you, you'll never have to think about this. But for others, you start working with stuff beyond topographic maps. This is, this is handy to, to have, to, to file away, right? That's the idea. And, and to think about this idea of a standard line or line of tangency. And here's some examples. It's not just the cylindrical one. You can see the conic and the planar and, and all that. That's how this works. We also have this oval projection, which is, gets into some more modern projections. We'll see that too, but it's still, it has that standard line. And so we'll, you know, we want to be aware of it. Chances are, if you have something that's an oval shape or or cylindrical kind of square boxy shape, that standard line is going to be at the equator, right? Unless designated otherwise. Okay, and we'll, yeah, again, we'll, we'll get into this stuff. All right. Oh, so one thing here, this is worth mentioning, a secant projection. It's where we have the, the uh, surface. It actually cuts through the globe. And so again, we're getting beyond holding a candle in a you know a 15th uh, century globe and you know that idea. Um, so we're getting into more advanced modeling concepts here. But it's like we take that cylinder and we send it through the globe, and we can actually get two standard lines. All right, and that's pretty cool. So rather than just having it be you know golden at the equator right there with that secant one on the right. You've actually got, um, up at the Tropic of Cancer and down at the Tropic of Capricorn, we've got, that's where the thing exits. So you've just, what you're getting with that is just a little less distortion up in a place like North America and, and down in the, the chunk of, of South America. Maybe that's what you need, right? So that's why you would pick that secant projection. And I don't know, yeah, I don't have another example, so don't, don't worry about it. All right. Third decision, light source. And here's that idea. This is kind of a cool image because it's showing you the concept of projecting this stuff. So we'd have that planar surface at the bottom. The light is inside the globe, casting light down. And so you can see the graticule there, right, as it's projected onto that surface. So that's, that's what we're dealing with. That's what we're talking about here, right? But we can move the light anywhere. That's the, the cool thing here. Um, and don't worry, this gets into, like I said, kind of more archaic stuff here, but it's the idea that you can put it inside, put it on the opposite side. You can move it around and that'll tweak shadows, right? You've messed around with flashlights and like, you know, sleep over in summer camp and, and stuff like that. You've you made, you know, shadow puppets and, and those things. We see how that works. So just moving the light can give us different results. So that's another one we want to think about here. Uh, and then finally, so all these things, our surface, our orientation, the lighting choices, all that, it's going to affect, as we've seen, where distortion is occurring and also what kind of distortion. And so we're going to have distortion no matter what, but it's going to be different for different projections, right? Different uh, decisions that have been made here. And the end result, that end map, it's going to retain certain properties, okay? And we divide them into what we call major properties and then the minor properties. 
And so with this, the major properties are conformality and equivalence. Two fancy words that really aren't that fancy. I'll get into what these things mean in a second, but here's the deal. With, with these major properties, you can only have one that's retained, that works. So you can have conformality on your map projection, but that means your equivalence, yeah, that's shot to hell, right? Or you can preserve equivalence, but ah, oh, there goes your conformality, okay? Um, and and here, what it means, conformality means shape and angles, right? Equivalence means size. So it's the idea, okay, I can main, maintain proper sizes, but my shapes, they look funky, right? Or I go, oh, I can keep my shapes and my angles and all that, but now my sizes, they're screwed up, right? You have to pick one, all right? Then the minor properties, you can, you can have different kind of combinations here. It's not as extreme, that either or kind of deal, hence the minor property. But distance and direction, those are pretty obvious to what they're talking about. But what's great, I think, about just thinking about these properties, whether it's shape, size, distance, direction, these are all things that seem pretty standard, right? Like a map should be able to tell you the proper distance from point A to point B, or what direction you need to go. If you're at point A, then you want to get to point B, or how big this whole area is, or, you know, any of this stuff, right? Not all maps can do that. And that's, that's the big thing. That's what we don't take that we do take for granted and we don't think about is the fact that this map I'm looking at, yeah, I can draw all these lines I want and get azimuths and then try to copy that out in the real world, but it, it might be horribly wrong. And I'll, I'll show examples of this kind of big, broad examples here, but uh, like I'm saying, this is just, this is stuff you want to keep in mind. All right. So, all right, let's, let's get into that. So conformality. As I said, a fancy word that means shape. And technically, we're, if we want to define it, we want to talk like academics, so we'd say it's the retention of correct angles, which means shape, right? Think about it. Like, if a triangle retains the correct angles, like let's say you're looking at a triangle in, in reality. I don't, I don't know, I guess I'm triangle here, right? And you're trying to draw it. Um, on a sheet of paper, if you retain those correct angles, the different sides of the triangle, well then, my God, that, that triangle you draw, it's going to be the right shape triangle, right? It's not going to look funky. It's not going to be an isosceles or you got to draw a right triangle or, you know, whatever um, on there. So that's what we mean by these angles. Its shapes are going to be great. These maps, maps with conformality, have been fantastic for navigation for centuries now. That's why we like these. That's why we still use them, despite some of the flaws that we'll see. So that's an, an important thing here. Okay, And you can tell that you're dealing with a map that maintains conformality if you look at your latitude and longitude lines. Okay, These grid lines that are running uh, up and down here. Okay, um, They're going to cross at right or 90 degree angles. And they're going to do that because that's what these things do in reality. Okay? If you look at a globe, it might be kind of uh, weird to look at because of the angle of the or the, the shape of the globe, but if you actually measure all of these latitude and longitude lines where they intersect, they're they're perpendicular, these lines. So they're they're crossing at these perfect 90 degree right angles. And so a map that maintains conformality it's going to have 90 degree angles to, at every, you know, possible point on the map itself. Okay, right? that's how you know you're dealing with this. Okay, now one thing with these maps that maintain conformality, this gets kind of funky, uh, is that the scale changes as you move around the map. So it's the idea of uh, distance here. It's correct in the sense that it's it's correct in your general area. So if I'm looking at this map right here, we've got this Mercator projection, and I've got, I've showed you one of these before, this kind of hourglass looking uh, graphical scale here, right? If I'm just doing stuff down near the equator, 
yeah, distances are going to be fantastic. And if I'm just doing stuff up near the North Pole, distances are going to be fantastic right there. But if I go from the North Pole down to the equator, you know, my distance can be screwed up, right? So it's kind of it's kind of fuzzy in, in the sense of is is distance true on these maps or not? Okay, but but the deal is we could account for that. And so this Mercator projection, it's named for good old Gerardus Mercator. I was the guy who came up with it. And you can see the date here, back in 1569. So it's a really old projection. This was the first time we had a truly conformal map projection. Okay? That was the big deal here. And this was fantastic for, I mean, you, again, looking at the date, this is the age of exploration in Europe, right? This is when you have a bunch of white dudes sailing all over the world to try to you know, take stuff from brown people uh, around there. Not not our, our finest moment, white folks. Um, but the idea um, with this is that Mercator, why he was such a big shot here, is well, he basically, I feel like a real ass now, getting excited about it. But yeah, basically what he did, he, he developed a tool to make it easier to take stuff from brown people. All right, so it's okay. Again, not our finest moment, white folks. Um, but still, all right, the idea is, I mean, this was amazing that you have this map. And now what you could do is you could say, okay, I'm here over in Europe, and I want to I get these brown people over here. So, okay, that's where they are. And you could draw a line from where you are to where you want to go. And that line, that direction, wow, that's, that's fantastic. You point your ship in that direction. And that azimuth, you're going to get there. We were never able to do that before. At all. So now you have these great maps and charts where sailors could take them out and you could plot courses and you could use your compass and you could get to where you wanted to go. That's fantastic. I just realized I was looking at the wrong screen uh, here. I thought I had advanced it uh, and hadn't. Here's Gerardus Mercator. There's the date. It's been a long day. I'm tired. I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, there you go. Here's this is this is good old. Gerardus. Um, okay, that's that's the idea. I'll, I'm sure I'll edit this later in post. Okay, so here are the issues with this. The problems we have with the Mercator projection uh, is that the distortion in there, uh, yeah, okay, so hey, great. Look, we can draw a line from point A to point B to the right direction, but the distance can be really screwed up. Sometimes that distance from point A to point B is not actually the shortest way to get there, right? Which is kind of weird. We hear about that, like, you know, in math class, they love to say the, the shortest, you know, way to get between two points is a straight line or whatever they say, not on a Mercator projection. And that's important to be aware of. All right, so here, take this composite image of the Earth, right? And I projected it using a Mercator projection. We can see those lines running through there. It's latitude and longitude. They all meet at these 90 degree angles, but it's pretty clear when we look at it this way that we're, we're dealing with some distortion. In fact, typically you don't see a Mercator map looking like this at all. We crop it, right? We get rid of all that Antarctica nonsense because that's, that's garbage and all this North Pole Arctic Sea stuff, that's garbage. So we just, we kind of crop it that way. That's what we're used to looking at, okay? Now, with the Mercator projection, it's, it's the, the reason we have this, this distance issue, it's because, yes, it's got the conformality, but what can't it have? Equivalence, right? Size is screwed up. And our standard line is down here at the equator. So down here, yeah, stuff's pretty good, right? I mean, shapes are gorgeous throughout. But then when you, uh, uh, you know, are near the equator, it's all sizes. It's okay, right? But as you go further north or further south, the size all goes to hell. And a clue, and we'll see this as we look at other things, um, that you're dealing with screwed up size. Look at Greenland and look at Mexico. If they're on the map you're looking at. These two places are the same size in reality, right? So if you look at a globe, or if you actually fly over Greenland or you fly over Mexico, they're going to look the same in terms of size. But on a Mercator projection, because those shapes are so good, 
the size is screwed up. That's that distortion as we go from round to flat, right? This was an issue when we had, oh, I don't know, see you kids are too young uh, for the most part. You don't remember the good old days of the Cold War when we, we were enemies with the Soviet Union, you know, the, the Russians. They were, oh, evil. You know, it's what, it's what we said. They were they were, you know, no more screwed up than, than we were. But still, we were we were mortal enemies. We had to destroy them. And so one issue with the Mercator map was that uh, it made the Soviets look really big and scary compared to us, right? Because the distortion, because they were further north, and so it just made them look bigger, right? We get a little going on with Alaska right there. Alaska looks ridiculously huge, but still... And you could crop it. If you were, you know, Russian, you could just crop this thing right here and show our dear, puny, little, tiny United States and, and the mighty Mother Russia uh, right there. Scary. But if you look at reality, yeah, actually not that much different, right? It's just, it's our perception. It's how we see this stuff. In fact, Robinson, um, Arthur Robinson, the guy I've been talking about, he made his own projection, the Robinson Projection. Which was said, it was a way, it's a compromise projection, we'll talk about that. But there's a way to deal with, you know, some of the issues with Mercator's projection. And I don't know this, but I kind of feel like there was some pressure to get rid of the Mercator projection here in the U.S. because of the Russians. Because it made us look so wimpy. And so the Robinson thing, well, there's no evidence of it. This is total conspiracy theory stuff. But I think it was just, it was a way to make us feel bigger, um stronger and tougher uh, and all that so the maps you know maps are important there's a lot of psychology behind this stuff now another way to look at it i took so that same composite image and i made it geoidal right here right and i copy and pasted these yellow uh circles around here so they're all the same size and i'm just going to put them in in different spots around here and then i projected it using the mercator projection and so you can see with these uh, yellow circles, some of them are much bigger, some of them are, uh, um, you know, roughly the same size if we were to compare this stuff. And you can also see that distortion in terms of the uh, the shape there. You might say, hey, what's going on here with this, this shape stuff? But that's, again, it's that distortion idea as we're moving further away from the standard line. It also has to do with exactly where I place them. They're not perfectly on the, the surface of the earth they're just kind of floating in space if that makes sense but still you can see with the size what's going on here right how crazy this gets now the other thing we have is uh, that whole, whole idea of uh, not necessarily having the shortest distance right you can see that here this is actually yeah, this is from robinson's book uh, so if you were to draw a line we have from kansas city to Moscow, right? Ooh, the enemy right there. So if you were to draw that line, and let's say you had a plane, you wanted to fly from Kansas City to Moscow for whatever reason, you, um, well, I, I mean, kind of whatever, I'd rather be in Moscow than Kansas City, but still. So it's the idea you're going to fly from one to the other. If you had a Mercator projection, yes, you could draw that line, get that azimuth, point your plane in the right direction, and you would get to Moscow. That would work. It would be okay. Problem is you're taking the long way there, right? The short way, the shortest distance, would be to follow this great circle route, which goes back to that where you cut a sphere into two equal halves following like longitude lines or all great circles, uh, that whole idea. So what we're seeing, that shortest distance on this sphere-ish planet, right? It's sphere-ish, um, would be to follow that solid line there. Now on the map that looks stupid. Why are you flying up into Greenland and then down? It looks like you're going to go twice the distance, but you're not. It's actually shorter to go that way. And we could play around with this if we were actually in a classroom, have a globe and a piece of string and all the, you know, there are ways to, to test this stuff. But that's the, that's one of the issues there, right? So shape is good. Size is screwed up. And then, you know, Distance is okay in small bits, but that can be be funky as we see here. But direction, direction is pretty pretty solid on this thing. Okay, now this was great for navigation, especially 
back if, you know, we go back to the 1500s or whatever, because you don't have a plane. Nobody in a ship from Europe is going to say like, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to sail up into the Arctic and we'll get to Greenland. Well, I don't know. We'll break down the ship and we'll hike it over and then we'll sail back down and all that. No, you had limited options here. They didn't have planes. So you, you have the Atlantic Ocean. That's what you had to use. And so you get what I'm saying? So, so it worked back then. But of course now with air travel, it's a little different. Okay. All right. So there's, there's Mercator uh, and conformality, right? Now let's look at equivalence, size, or what we call equal area projection. Size is fantastic. But of course, it means our shapes, our angles. That's gone. So when we're dealing with one of these maps that maintains equivalence, a big clue is that latitude and longitude lines, the, the ones that we see intersecting, some of them might be at 90 degree angles, but not all of them, right? They won't consistently cross at 90 degree or right angles. So if you're looking at that, that's, there's something right there, right? So these shapes here, what this is showing is that, uh, you know, the shapes are all different, right? But the size, if you do the math, I assume I've never bothered to do it, but the idea is, if the people who came up with this example were correct, that if you multiply, you know, length times width and you get the area, you're going to get the same number consistently in here. So shape is garbage, size is perfect. And you can think, okay, what, why do I care? about this stuff. Well, let's look at these these Perus, shall we? So the one on the left has a good looking Peru. That's what Peru is supposed to look like right there. And then the one in the middle, it, it's squishy. And the one on the right is stretched out, right? But here's the deal. You know, it depends on what you're studying. If I'm studying, say, remaining rainforest in Peru, right? The remaining actual rainforest vegetation in the country, well then, then you know, do I really care about the shape? I don't care what shape the forest is. I want to know how many acres or hectares or square kilometers or whatever it is I have of the stuff. You follow? So if I'm doing some kind of analysis in terms of, you know, how much of something, some area exists around the world, I want a map that maintains equivalence. I don't need that conformality, right? If I'm navigating, if I'm sailing a ship from one side of the ocean to the other, yeah, I need those angles. I need that for my direction and all that, right? So I need that conformality. Uh, and the size, I can adjust for that. Don't need to worry about it. Okay, that's the idea. That's what we're dealing with here. Uh, and here's an example of Greenland and Mexico, effectively the same size, right? When we set them next to each other using the an idea of equivalence here um, with the thing. So in this case, the, the shape's not necessarily perfect. I forget exactly what I pulled these from, but the size, you can see much closer in size than what we see on that Mercator projection. So this is a sinusoidal map. It's a fun one to say, and it looks funky, you know, shape-wise. It's kind of pointy uh, and weird looking. If we look at, especially out here, if we look at our latitude and longitude lines, that's not a perfect uh, perpendicular crossing right there. We've got these little tiny acute angles right there, right? And the bigger angles over there. So that's a clue. And we look at Mexico. We look at Greenland. Much closer in size. We're dealing with equivalence, right? And we would pick this. Let's say we are looking at rainforest cover right and so yeah we want to see what's you know what's still around in say peru and up here in brazil and just in the amazon over here but also we want to measure the congo right and what's going on in you know malaysia borneo and southeast asia we want to record all of this stuff we want to analyze it in terms of you know area how many square miles of rainforest do we still have on this planet this map projection would be perfect right if we use the Mercator thing, in fact, a really good example of where this would screw us up, let's not say rainforest, let's say uh, glacial ice, right? Remaining glacial ice. If we're doing that with the sinusoidal, perfect. Like Antarctica looks funky, but you know what? It's the right size. 
so we can measure that out and, and get a sense of how much glacial ice is still there. Same thing with up in Greenland and around the, the Arctic, right? If we use the Mercator projection, think back to that ridiculous distortion, you know, we'd have to be really careful with the scales that we used and how we did this stuff. And there's a good chance we're going to get it wrong. If anything, it's going to make it look like, oh, what, what climate change? We're fine. We've got tons of ice. We've got 50 bazillion, uh, you know, square miles of it or whatever. We get that wrong answer because we pick the wrong map. Hopefully that makes sense. And then here are our yellow circle thing. Again, like I, I showed you, you can see, and we get some, some, still some funkiness where it kind of goes off the side. I should really fix that someday. Um, but you can see for the most part throughout here, these, these shapes might be off, but the size is all pretty good as we go along here. This is another one. This is called the Good Interrupted. It's G-O-O-D-E Interrupted. This is kind of cheating. It's a projection, but they do some of this cutting in there. And it's the idea that if you don't really care about the oceans, again, you're just measuring stuff here, um, need to have you know more proper sizes, this works great for that. And of course, you know, if you are doing glacial ice, this wouldn't be good because you know Greenland and Antarctica get all, all cut up there. But you get the idea. And again, you get the idea. All right, now these other ones, direction and distance, as I said, they're minor properties. They can, they can, it's not so much an either or kind of thing, but just direction when we're talking about that, we're talking about azimuth. And I, I think I mentioned this before. Somebody asked a question about it, I think, before. Um, uh, you know, what, what is it? This is the concept right here. So north corresponds with zero degrees and we always write it in three numbers here are three digits rather even if it's not a three digit number right so it's not zero it's zero 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 it's just how you write it make sure you're clear with stuff i guess um so that corresponds with north right east south west right there so an azimuth is just some line right corresponding with this this uh number scheme Right, so a 45 degree azimuth is going here. It's it's northeast. It's the same as northeast, right? That's the, the idea. But what we're saying with direction is that on this map, if it maintains direction, we can draw that line from point A to point B, all right, and they're in some direction, and it corresponds with the correct azimuth if we were to actually stand in reality and hold up our compass and take that azimuth. Right? That's the idea. Just a reminder, not all maps can do that. Okay, Some of these, these uh, uh, mnemonic ones as the mutual ones that we have, yes, they very clearly do that um, in the sense, but you, well, you know what? We're not going to mess with these. And I'm tired of talking. Uh, you get the idea. You can play around with it. All right, and then distance, it, it just means, you know, it means what it means. It, it means that, that it maintains proper distance, right? Well, that's obvious. Um, this one right here, I love this one. This is called an azimuthal equidistant map projection. And it's the idea that it's it's maintaining direction and distance in here. It's got both of those bad boys going on. And what you see, that white ring around there is Antarctica. Um, what's great about this is that flat earth people, um, who I love, I have a special place in my heart for flat earthers, um, I, you know, because I'd say, well, number one, you know, you guys just, you just, you're going along with my whole geoid nonsense, right? But a flat earther, which I don't think any of you guys are, I haven't picked up that vibe at all, but a flat earther would say nonsense and would go out and try to keep disproving me and, and would never be able to um, because, come on, it's not a flat earth. But still, I like that, I like that gumption right there. But this, so anyway, this, this projection was used, especially with satellite images, it was to show that, uh, you see, the Earth is actually flat, and we have this ring of ice, and that's why the ocean water doesn't fall over the edge or, or whatever. There have been variations on that. But this is a great one, not only for proper direction and distance, but also, you know, to prove the Earth is flat. Something to think about. All right. Finally here, we're wrapping up. We're getting there, baby. Don't worry. Finally, we also have this last... God, 
category, a projection, we call compromise. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't know where that came from. All right, so compromise, projection. It's the, it's the flat earth thing. Uh, I get so worked up when I start thinking about people trying to, to prove that the earth is flat. Um, so a compromise projection is where, look, we don't need this map for navigation. All right? I'm not sailing from Europe to the New World, or I'm not you know, measuring glacial ice or something like that. I just need to look at the Earth. I just I have no idea where Uganda is, right? And I don't know where Uganda is in relation to the Antelope Valley. And I just I want to know it. And I don't want to get a globe because it's tiny and it's round and I have to move it around and it's frustrating. I just want a nice looking map of the Earth, right? Can I can I get that to figure out where Uganda is, please? A compromise projection. That's what you want. Where it meets in the middle, right? It's not maintaining proper equivalence. But it's also not maintaining proper conformality. It shapes off, sizes off, but it's it's meeting in the middle. So everything's off, but not by too much. And so as long as you're not doing any real scientific work with the thing, you're going to be okay, right? This is the Winkle Triple projection. This is a good-looking one. It's the one National Geographic likes to use. And so if you look at it, uh, it's, it's a good looking map. It's it's kind of a sexy looking map, and we don't, you know, we we can see that like the latitude and longitude lines are are uh, you know not at perfect ninety degree angles as we move around here. Okay, but then also size is off a little bit. Greenland is a little bit bigger than it should be, and stuff like that. So there's error in here. Size is off, shape is off, but it looks good. It works, and in fact, I can even I was just. Uganda just came to mind. I could I could point uh, you know to where it is in, in Africa here, but the, the countries are right here, so don't don't worry about it. But if instead we look at our little yellow circles, you can see that distortion is a little bit more than with some of these other maps in, in different aspects here, but it works. Alright, and that's what a compromise projection is for. Alright, it's to simply have some kind of visual reference. All right, so I want to wrap up with here is this idea with a map projection. Look, they're they're screwed up. They've got issues, but you know what? Don't we all? Right? Like the only thing, the only representation of the planet that we got that isn't doesn't have distortion is a globe. A globe maintains proper size, shape, direction, distance. All right, so a globe is it's perfect because it's just a little shrunken Earth. But, you know, at this point, if we we're actually meeting in the classroom, you would have already, I would have forced you to use globes repeatedly, and you would be sick of them because you'd be trying to look at one thing and then another, and they're just, they're awkward. So to have a map, especially when you're dealing with the entire world, um, you know, to have a, a map that you can use to see what's going on in Australia and what's going on in Canada at the same time, all maps are great, right? Same thing. When you're out hiking around in the middle of nowhere, you don't want to be carrying a big globe with you. You want to have a nice map of that area and be able to use it. So, yeah, globe maintains all these correct values here. But if I know what this map that I picked is good for, and I know what it's not good for, well, that's okay, right? I can pick the best map for whatever it is I need to do. But the key is, I need to be thinking about that, and I need to be aware of what a map can do and what it can't do. And that's why map projections are important. You follow? You dig? Hopefully you do. Um, all right, there you go. That's enough nerdy stuff for uh, today. So, yeah, watch this. Take notes. Learn it. Live it. Love it. And, uh, and don't worry. We're getting through a lot of this this vegetable nonsense. We're going to get to the good, fun stuff. We're going to play around with stuff in a bit here. All right? All right. I'll, I'll talk to you later.